there were more and more foreigners coming into Hawaii and stopping, wanting to stop, particularly at Kona because they knew that's where the, the king resided. And for diplomatic relations to talk, talk about, oh, okay, maybe we can have a, a diplomatic treaty between countries and things like that. So Kamakahonu was the center of the Hawaiian universe as far as government and uh, negotiations with any kind of foreign government. Next. Here's another image of uh, Kamakohonu by Herb Kani, the famous uh, artist Herb Kani. Here showing uh, Akuenahea with a visiting ship. We don't know the visiting ship in this case. And I don't know when he uh, like was trying to, to set this, what year he was trying to put it in. But here, it, what's interesting to see is here's um, some Kanaka uh, who are talking with two foreigners over here. So interaction with foreigners was very common at this time of Kamehameha's reign. And it's showing you how much influence now foreigners are having on individual chiefs, on the, on the community at large. So we're well into uh, foreign influence in the kingdom. Next. So what were the events leading up to the death of Kamehameha? <clears throat> yes. Kamehameha's health. In the seven years living at Kailua, Kamehameha enjoyed a peaceful life, spending much of his free time fishing. Kamehameha was described as being, quote, strong, his eyes not dim, head not bowed, and he did not lean upon a cane. It was his gray hair only that one could tell his age. Now his age ranges somewhere between, when he died, 60 and 80, roughly. Kamehameha was described as being, oh, okay, did that part. It was also mentioned that he was missing his two front teeth. It is said that he bashed out his own teeth in mourning for the death of one of his wives. Ali'i Wahine Kalola. And I'll talk more about teeth bashing. Next. Here's another picture of King Kamehameha at, at Kona. And this is my favorite picture of Kamehameha of all time. Because what's different about the way he's dressed here? He's what? I heard it. He look, he's dressed as a commoner. He's not dressed in the royal Ali Regalia. Right. So to me, I really like this because it's showing his humbleness, that he's a man after all. He's not a god, you know, even though he's the highest mo'i of the land, chief of the land. He, underneath it all, loves to go fishing. That's his favorite pastime in his retirement. He loved to go fishing, and um, this is his favorite fish to fish for, which is aku. aku. Who knows the English word for aku? What? Tuna. Uh, skip jack tuna. Skip jack tuna. Uh, so look at his gesture. He's standing up and he's going like this and gesturing to showing the fish down there. And I, I interpret this as him saying, come, go, look. This is the fish I caught. Everybody, come, come. This is for you, my people, to feed my people. So I really, really like this one. And who is this one person in the left-hand side? Some of you may, uh, uh, there's a famous painting, a full painting of this person that has the same uh, body formation. Anybody recognize that person? Queen? Ka'ahumanu, by Ka'i, by Ka'i Ho, Polole. So this is, yes, in fact, in fact, one of his many, many wives, we don't know how many for sure that Kamehameha had, but uh, Queen Ka'ahumanu was his favorite wife, and more importantly, or as important, his most politically astute and important uh, wives. So, who, who also resided in Kamakamonu. Next. Now, Kamehameha is sick, 
and I'll talk about the sickness in a minute. And as, as the, his doctors are gathering around him, they're saying, okay, time is coming. He's, he appears to be um, maybe on his deathbed. So what they do is they call together the chiefs of the area and the different districts on the island coming together to talk story and say, okay, what are we going to do next when he dies? So this is a gathering of the chiefs. And there's a couple of oddball people in here. One is a makainana, or a commoner, who's blowing a conch shell uh, to represent that the call man. They sent men blowing conch shells out into the community, far and wide, to announce that something's imminent is going to occur. And they also called out these same messengers uh, who ran from district to district, village to village, or, or in canoes to, to put out the word. And they may also made a call, a kahe, to bring in all the best of the, uh, the healers of the land, the traditional healers. So here's one of a representation, representation of a healer that's going to be coming into the court now into Kumakamoni. Oh wait, go back. I wanted to point out that this is painting is by Brooke Parker. Her Connie passed away a number of years ago and up until his death, he was our premier artist uh, uh, depicting life of our older times. So upon his passing, sort of he passed the mantle on to this younger Hawaiian artist named Brooke Parker. And this is one of his works. Next. So here's a picture of, uh, done by a foreigner. This is not anybody in particular. The label is just a kahuna. Okay. So kahuna, the, the word kahuna is, um, a lot of people don't understand it. They usually associate it with strictly priestly class. Yes, kahuna were priestly class. But you know what? There were dozens of different kinds of kahuna. There were kahuna la'ao la ba'ao, there were kahuna va'a, there were kahuna for different means. So kahuna does not mean priest. The word does not mean priest. It means somebody with a lot of knowledge about something, and a particular subject. It can be many different subjects. So don't, um, don't confuse that. Kahuna does not just mean priest. residential compound. There were a number of houses. Um, this one, Kamehameha actually had two different houses, Hale. And in his last days, he chose and told his uh, counselors, I want you to put me in this house, which was called Hale Nana Mahina Ai, or just Mahina Ai, which means fisherman. Oh, excuse me, farmer. So Kamehameha, being uh, like all the Ali of the land, were land managers, and they helped to uh, uh, maintain the natural resources of our lands, so that if they, you wouldn't overfish, you wouldn't over, over uh, take out too many crops and things like that. So they were tremendous land managers, the Ali. So he chose to be in this house, right next to Ahu and Ahea. Next. This is Brooke Parker's um, interpretation of what his deathbed scene looked like. So we have Kamehameha lying down on a, a mat, very nice. And I think this is not just your typical uh, Laohala mat. What, what do you think this is? Some of you may know this different kind of mat. Starts with an M. Makaboa mat, which um, usually is is identifiable because it has this dual pattern, light and dark, light and dark, and very small weaving pieces. So Makaloa was considered to be the best kind of um, a matting you can have. So naturally, he would have that at his deathbed. And then he's surrounded by different kahuna, kahuna right here, and attending to his last wishes and, and offering prayers. And he's surrounded by medical men of different types, 
And notice that um, these, these practitioners in this particular picture are kuna la'au la'au. La'au la'au means uh, mem, uh, uh, practitioners who use medicinal plants for healing. So if you look closely, some of the people can uh, pick this out. We have different, um, uh, typical different plants for healing, noni, we have uh, ko, uh, we have lots of different things. And, and then they're attended and doing uh, all the prayers that they need to do. Next. There was an unusual person there at Kamakahonu when the king died. His name was Don Francisco de Paula Marin. He was a Spaniard who arrived in Hawaii in 1793. He was a horticulturist, interpreter, and de facto physician to King Kamehameha I, even though he had no medical training whatsoever. But my theory, and some other people, is that he became uh, to attend to his physical needs, maybe because he was an uh, agriculturalist and knew uh, uh, medical treatments, plant treatments. So uh, there were a couple of other foreigners who, who were at Kumbakamona, but he was kind of the most prominent. Yes. The final moments before his death. How many, there were, the counselor of chiefs were gathering, right, as, as he was in his deathbed, and there were going two major things that were on their mind. One is, how many people should be sacrificed? Okay. Up to the very moment that he died, it was traditional that you have to uh, sacrifice humans for, for the uh, lady who died. And it depended on uh, the number of sacrifices, sacrificial people, depended on your rank. The higher rank you were, the more sacrificial people you had. And what was the intent? Why were people sacrificed? Well, to what end? To go with him. To go with him into the afterworld. Yes, to attend to his needs in the afterworld. Not unlike the uh, Egyptians of old, where they were buried in their pyramids and then they had all these other people to attend to them, that they were sacrifices and were buried in the temple, the pyramid. The other thing, the major uh, thing that was on everybody's mind was who should, uh, who should hide the Evi of the king? It was traditional, um, mostly for the Ali, but sometimes the Maka'ainana, but not very often. But Ali'i for sure, that when you die, your Evi must must be hidden away secretly. Because why? What were, why did they need to do that? Sacred. What's that? Sacred. What's the, yes, the, the Evi were the most sacred part of the human body. Uh, your mana, your mana resided in the Evi. Your mana was your spiritual power, your spiritual essence. It's what made you the most human, okay, to have mana. And the higher rank, the higher your mana is. So this was very important to hide the EV the, uh, e away from the general populace because it was common that when a Ali died, another district who had a different Ali, and they were if they were rivals, that rival chief would try to go and steal the EV. Okay? And somebody might come in, the chief might come, send people to come steal Kamehameha's EV and then take it back to their village and use it to make fish hooks, to make pendants, to make, um, you have, you know what a kahili is, the feather thing, and then it has a pole like this that comes down to hold it. They would cut the bones to be part of the handle of that kahili. So, all of those gestures with the EV into uh, using them for alternative purposes was very humiliating. It was the worst thing that could happen to somebody's EV to be used in that way. And sometimes chiefs would steal the EV, go make a spear tip, put it on a spear, go back to the village where the chief died and go, ha, 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 look what I got on my spear. I got your chief's wound on the top of my spear. How humiliating is that? 
starts another war. <laughs> so very important decision they had to make. Now, in order to have a, a sacrifice, somebody had to die. Okay. There were very different ways that they killed people for, uh, for human sacrifice. And these are the same methods that were used for anybody who broke the kapu. This could happen to you. Any number of kapus, okay, if they of the highest rank. So one of the ways was a, what's called ka'abe, or strangulation. So here's a garret tied around his neck, and this guy is pulling as hard as he can to strangle, strangle this one. Here's um, a sacrifice, a guy tied to a board, and somebody else coming to strike him and, and beat him to death. And this was called haha. Ha ha. There were many other forms, I'm sure, but this is the only two illustrations of it I could find. Next. So the debate ensues. How many, how number of moi pu'u, which were sacrifices, uh, sacrifices, sacrifices uh, were determined, determined by social status. Could, so it could be, if you were a lower chief, only two or three human sacrifices. But if you were of the highest rank, like Kamehameha, it could go up to 30 or more. So it's estimated that Kamehameha had about, we don't know for sure, but 30 boy food. Okay, next. Now, everybody in the who grew up in the Hawaii and got to an age, they saw it when chiefs died, everybody learned that there were going to be sacrifices. So, in this case, what happened, the commoners in the, in the community Heard about, okay, okay, they're calling group sacrifices here. We're, we're going to get out of town. So they went on that. This is Kona down here and um, the bay is right here. This is looking towards Hualalai volcano up into the uplands. So they took off on foot to get out of town. Or they got in canoes and they went down the coast to escape. Not everybody went. There were still people left behind. Okay, next. However, this was a turning, major turning point in custom and tradition that Kamehameha is instituting now. Kamehameha, in his wisdom, declares a kapu against human sacrifices upon his deathbed. Okay, never been done before. Never, ever, by anybody. So this was very radical, very unprecedented. Um, so uh, moi pu'u are called, are, the interpretation is death companions, right? Now when all of this is going on, and they're, they're trying to grasp what Kamehameha is telling them to do, to stop the sacrifices, uh, two people in particular have been identified as saying, no, no, don't, don't do that. We'll be the sacrifices. We don't want this tradition to die. So two people came forward that we know of. One was Ke'amahuli Pia, a close friend of Kamehameha, who threw himself upon the corpse and begged to be sacrificed. Where have you never heard that before, somebody begging to be sacrificed? But he did, he did but he wasn't allowed to. Another, uh, Ali Inui, who wanted to sacrifice himself, was the famous chief, Kalani Moku. But again, he was rebuffed. Sorry, we're going we're gonna to follow the words of our Mo'i on his deathbed, and we're not going to allow sacrifices. So that was a critical change, historical change in our culture, in Hawaiian culture, to have that happen. The kiss of death. Just after midnight on May 8th, same date as today, Kamehameha's closest relatives and court advisors entered the death hall to horny kiss the dying king by touching noses and to say their last goodbye. There were a number of people that came and went through that night. Here's a few of them. Libo Libo, his son and heir, who we'll talk about in a minute. 
Queen Kaahumanu, his favorite wife, Queen Keopuolani, his sacred wife, Chief Kalani Moku, Chief Keao Moku, and at least two uh, foreigners, John Young, who was an American, and Don Francisco Marin, who was the Spaniard. Next. His last words. There's two phrases attributed to his last words. Endless is the good that I have given to you to enjoy. The other ver um, version is Enjoy peacefully the honest principles for which I have stood. So we're sure he, he uttered those words. One version of those, that, that, okay, next. His cause of death. In his later years, Kamehameha suffered greatly from chronic insomnia, a condition called kanikani aula, kanikani aula, insomnia. He also suffered with recurring nightmares and loss of appetite. Over a period of several months, he began to waste away, although his mind was still sharp. So, take it, you know, given that he's between 60 and 80, and I think most of you are in the crowd are between 60 and 80. <laughs> okay? And I know I am, and I would know that I, people my age, they get all kinds of different things going on, health issues. Uh, so after a period of several months of, of being in that condition, he began to waste away. He had loss of appetite. So he's getting frailer and frailer. But his mind, they say, was still sharp. Yes. So the king, he dies. Now the king is dead. Long live the king. Kamehameha now had, had identified his heir. He could have uh, identified anybody, uh, assigned anybody. But he assigned one of his sons, Liho Liho, King Kamehameha, who became King Kamehameha II, who was only age 30, 23. And that's an important part because he was, uh, although he's not that young, he's not a teenager as other people were, but uh, he's still young and in inexperienced. Here's another big turning point, a political turning and cultural turning point. Before Kamehameha dies, um, you know, he, he does, uh, he, he stops at the practice of sacrifice, but he, instit and he institutes a very important concept, the concept of Kuhina Nui. Who would be translated either as prime minister or co-ruler. So up until that time, no Ali who was appointed, got to be the highest Ali of the land, they didn't have any co-rulers to help them. This was the first time Kuhina Nui was appointed, and it was his uh, favorite wife and most political wife, Kahumanu, to co-rule with this younger Ali now. This caused all kinds of problems. Because they said, what, what, how can you do that? You know, this, how is that supposed to work? We never had this before. They were kind of too dizzy. How are we going to govern like this? How is that going to work out between these two? So, it was an incredible turning point in Hawaiian history. Next. And here's another um, political turning point. When Ali'i of the land, they all have different gods, favorite gods and different gods to protect them. And um, Kamehameha the Great had his, what, uh, his war god, Ku. And this image, which is a feather image, this is a real Ku image. He took Ku with him wherever he went in his travels around the Hawaiian, the Hawaiian Islands. And so, Ku was very, 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 very important to Kamehameha in his rule because he was a warrior, warrior king, and he wanted to uh, take over all of the islands. So having, uh, being able to pray and have Ku close to him gave him more confidence, more power to do what he needed to do. So uh, traditionally, a Ku image, when 
when an Ali'i died, if they had a pilgrimage, and many did, uh, it would go to the sun and air. But the, the difference in Kamehameha was he did not give it to his son and heir. He gave it to the Holy Hill's cousin, Kekua Okalani, the Holy Hill's cousin. Oh, what a slap in the face is that? First he has to have Kuhina Nuri. Now he has, doesn't have the Ku as his war god. What does that say about how Kamehameha felt about his son? Yeah. Well, um, testimony from people who, who knew Liho Liho and observed him and, and his interaction with the people was not a good one. He was known to drink a lot. You know, alcohol became a very uh, uh, bad thing in our culture and it affected a lot of people. It affected him. Uh, he was known to be a heavy drinker and Kamehameha, his father, did not like it. He tried to stop it, but he didn't. So that was maybe one reason, and another reason that he was just too immature. He acted too immature. So for those reasons, um, this is what happens to me. What happened to me next? So upon the death, word gets out in the community, and all social norms break down. All social norms, not to a hundred percent, but to a great degree. So. Um, all of these things listed on this list were kapu during a regular reign, but upon the death, it was, it was allowed for people to have a certain degree of ritual chaos going on to help them relieve their grief, but it wouldn't let them go too far. You couldn't murder anybody or anything like that. Yeah. But you can, there was lots of drunkenness, exposing of one's genitalia. Oh, you can imagine what that caused. That's what caused the fighting. Okay. Uninhibited public fornication, lighting fires, taunting and insulting others, stealing, and the list goes on and on. There are many, many uh, forms of ritual chaos, ritual mourning. Yes. Um, now, here's a ritual form of mourning called uwe or uve, uh, verbal lamentation. That is what you saw me do at the very beginning. Uwe. Uwe. Verbal lamentation. In 1843, a man named James J. Jarvis, who was the publisher and editor of the Polynesian, which was one of the very first newspapers in Hawaii, and it was the government organ, they called it, the government-issued newspaper. And this is how the government told, informed, the population of what was going on in the government. So everything that had to do with government affairs was published in the Polynesian, and then the people read it and they knew what was going on in the government. They never had TV, they never had internet, they never had radios. So this was a way, a new way, a new way newspapers to get word out what's happening in the government. And it became a very, the Polynesian became a very essential publication in Hawaii. So this is what Jarvis says about hearing Uwe and, and vi witnessing it. Night and day was a dismal sound prolonged. Its first notes were low, gradually swelling until one full passionate burst filled the air and resonated among the neighboring rocks and hills, whose echo threw back the cry, rising almost to a shriek of bitterness. So, now even though people were accustomed to hearing the way, when it happened in your presence, it was very powerful, just as it was for, for, for you to listen to it, and for me to do it. Next. There were other forms of ritual mourning. Uh, the general term is, is manavaneva, extreme expression of grief. So, uwe is one of those expressions. Another one is knocking out of the teeth. And I illustrated that by having a lock to my teeth. Here's some illustrations, foreigners' interpretation and, or visualization of teeth knocked out in the front over here. Okay, next. A 
Another uh, form of mourning was to cut your hair in, a Swiss, in uh, different kinds of ways. So one is oki kikepa, ki kepa, where the man has a long, his long hair on one side, but short hair cut short on the one, the other side. Oki kikepa. The other one is oki. Oki means in general means to cut. One of the term, one of the definitions. So this one is oki mahi mahi ole. If you all came in through the front, you saw the statue of King Kamehameha the Great, right? And what was on his head? Mahi ole. Mahi ole. Okay. The feather helmet. So they cut it to look kind of like a mahi ole here. And then this one, oki pai. No. Yeah. Oki pai pai iole. Oki pai pai iole. Iole is the word for rat. That's one interpretation. Uh, so uh, I haven't found a really good description of what it looked like, but this is my guess that it was what we would call a buzz today. That it's cut short by the description I have. Okay, it cut short on the side, but with left the hair on the top. So today we would call this a buzz, right? So I think I think find a Hawaiian illustration of this cut. So I went online and I looked for somebody of uh, African American ancestry. Uh, and, and I like this one. I chose this one because he has kinky hair and many Hawaiians have kinky hair. More Hawaiians have kinky hair than straight hair. Okay, next. Another form of manava nava was the burning of the skin. Uh, by using a banana or, or I forgot to change this, banana or coconut roll. And this is what is here. So one is, I made these, I collected the material and made these. One's made out of uh, coconut fiber and another of banana, banana fiber. And you can come up and look at these things from the program. And you can handle them. So they would take that roll, make a small fire, put the roll in the fire, and then boom, push, put it on there and burn themselves in the face and the body angle. Here's another thing they did. Uh, they would tattoo themselves in Hawaiian called kakao, to tattoo. And this is an illustration from a foreigner who actually shows a cacao at the time. Somebody did this at the time of Kamehameha's death. And this is an enlargement of, of this. So it says at the top, Poe, which is a person or people, died. But this is unusual because it says May 5th, 1819. And then it says, Okay, it's hard for me to pronounce this the way they did this. Tamahama. 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 Sprinkled with salt, 
water, and sometimes olena or turmeric for its aromatic properties. So here's somebody uh, with a bowl and using a tea leaf, take the water and sprinkle it on your, the corpse. And to clean the corpse. So that's the first part. Then you come to the embalming, the e Ia loa, the Ia loa embalming. Here, the cleansed body, the chest is cut open, organs and tissues removed, and placed in a umeke or gourd. Um, this is not an actual person who's carrying the actual EV of Kamehameha, but uh, an example of a man carrying very, very large umeke. Then, uh, after the organs and tissues removed and cleaned out, uh, before it goes in the, actually before it goes in there. Uh, the body cavity is packed with salt as a preservative, and then the umeke is di disposed of at sea. Again, these things are defiled, and we don't want it in our village any longer, so we take it away, far away. Yes. The next part is called ki kipola kino, to wrap the body. So now the embalmment has been done, he's been cleaned, the embalmment has been done. So the naked body now has to be covered, covered with maya, banana leaves, volke, a paper mulberry, and kalo, taro leaves. So you wrap the body in that. And then, oh, and also puru from the hapu tree. tree. So this is my hapu tree in uh, my backyard, and here's a close up of it. And up on the uh, display table, it's puru that I got from my uh, hapu, hapu uh, bird tree. And you can come up. I want you all to handle this, put it in your hands, and you can feel how uh, silky it is. Puru was um, very important for various reasons in Hawaiian culture. And it even it, in Western times, it became a commodity. It would have uh, harvest puru and sell it in stores and on the market. Um, not many people know that, that it became a commodity. Next. Oh, wait, 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 go back, sorry. So then, let's see. You wrap the body in those trees and the puru, the, the leaves and the puru, and then you wrap all of that in couple. Okay, and now you have a bundle, and then you, I mean, you have a couple, and then you wrap that whole thing in an alohala mat. Alohala mat. And then you tie it up with senet or rope. And I have examples of senet up here that you can look at and feel. Uh, so you wrap up the whole bunch. Okay, next. Now, you have, even though you took out the organs and everything in there and you cleaned out internally, you still have his flesh on his bones, right? To dispose of. So then, the way to do that, and this is something I, I was new, to, pretty new to me. I knew a little bit of human sacrifice, I mean human emuing, because that's what happened to Captain Cook, and I've studied the death of Captain Cook as well. Uh, but I, I had it in my mind that it would be the emu that I know my whole life. But it turns out that's not how it happened. That's not what an emu for human beings. The emu for human beings would be this. This is the ground. So you have the rat corpse. And you dig a shallower hole. How, if you were, uh, how many of you have made uh, emu for pigs? OK, so answer this question. If, I had, if you had a 300 pound pig, how deep did you make the hole? Dig the hole. About uh, one foot? Four. Four? Three to four? The, the, the bigger the pig, the deeper the pit. So I found out in, in preparation doing for human being, you only dig it to about one foot deep. So here's a corpse shell, like out like this, and it's flat. So the difference between that and the pig is more shallow. So they dig, they dig a, a shallow hole and put the rat corpse in there. 